Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Hurricane Katrina blew in 10 years ago this month. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, we travel to New Orleans to speak with Oliver Thomas, who was city council president during the storm and its aftermath. I'll ask him what went wrong and what went right in the recovery. And later, we'll hear from New Orleans poet Sonny Patterson. All that and a few words from me on people, property and principles. Welcome to our program. Oliver Thomas knows a lot about survival and redemption. He was city council president at the time of Hurricane Katrina and well on his way to becoming the city's next mayor. The people of New Orleans were shocked when he pled guilty to accepting bribes and moved from city hall to federal prison not long after. After spending three years behind bars, he returned to New Orleans as an outspoken advocate as well as a popular radio host and playwright. We spoke to him at WBOK where he hosts The Morning Show. Describe your New Orleans of August 28th, 2005. Oh, uh, wow. August 28th, 2005. Uh, ooh, uh, my New Orleans uh, then was a city embracing itself for uh, a hurricane. Uh, nothing we had not done before. I'm a, I'm a Betsy kid, you know. Uh, uh, survived Betsy. I had uh, 11 feet of water in my home. Uh, we were rescued in boats. I lived in a shelter. Uh, and then we moved in with my aunt, who had 11 kids. So for me, you know, you know, it was just another hurricane on the way. And by the 30th, uh, what were we looking at? Two days later, uh, a shock. Uh, just really didn't understand what had just happened. Uh, feeling of being unprepared, you know. Uh, the city has just experienced uh, nature, Mother Nature's wrath. <clears throat> and I was trying to locate loved ones mm -hmm. like everybody else. This 10 years on, who do you think of in terms of those loved ones? Lives lost? Um, I think of Miss uh, Miss Joyce Green and her granddaughter, uh, who grew up with my mom, uh, who was found on the side of the house after people said nobody was there. I think of my brother, uh, who came back to help me, uh, who one morning said he didn't feel like getting up. And when I went back, he was in the same position in the hotel room when I found him. Uh, and I think about all those people. I think about Charlie Jones, you know. And I think about the Johnsons, who we went to rescue, who Mr. Johnson had had heart surgery and his wife he was 90 and his wife was 80, 80 something. And had we not got to them, they were doing like a lot of old people. They were working their way into the attic. Had they actually, had they gotten into the attic, they probably would have died. Because a lot of the people who, the older people got up in the attics, heat and suffocation. So they were on the list. Uh, a lot of people came to rescue, didn't know, there weren't street signs, they couldn't see them, they didn't know where they were going. So some of us were actually involved in checking lists of people as they came in. So I uh, think about rescuing them. Uh, I think about Tony Ledette uh, and his mom. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Tony was a 300 pound autistic kid. They had a couple boats that left him. And because uh, he was autistic and he was big and he was kind of out of control. You know, he didn't know what was going on. So. You know, I grew up in a family with a with a special sister. My sister was special, so you know they didn't. Thank God, I knew how to deal with him. So when we went back to get him, everybody kept trying to deal with him, and that wasn't the way you deal with him. The way to deal with him was to make sure his mom was okay. So once he saw his mom was okay, then uh, we were able to manage him. Your story uh, talks to insiders versus outsiders when it comes to understanding a place and understanding what might work in a place. Y you were, as an insider from here, mm -hmm. already dedicated to making change in the city before Katrina hit. What was the road, what was, the, why did you decide to get into local government and, and run for office and get elected? What did you hope you were gonna accomplish here? I did everything I said I was never gonna do. I was never coming back to New Orleans. I was never coming back to New Orleans because uh, I thought the city wasn't progressive enough and 
it's a hard knock city where people survive. We never live here. We always survive. And there's a difference between surviving and living. And in my community, the African American community, uh, I never thought we would have experienced living. So when I went away, I was like I was gone. I said I would never get married. I did that. And I would definitely never get involved in politics because I watched my mom and my aunt. My aunt had started one of the first political organizations in the city. And I would watch her meet with all of these politicians and all of these people in government and our streets weren't paved. And we had open canals that ran through our community and we didn't have bus service. So I was like, uh, uh, you know, but then I wound up doing all of it, <clears throat> you know, and I thought, I always thought I represented all of my friends who didn't make it, you know. I used to like to give speeches about when people say you're different, and I used to basically say, no, I'm not. You know, I'm Daryl Sumler who did 42 years in Angola until he died. You know, I'm Otto and Dexter. You know, I'm Kenny Black who was murdered when he was 16. You know, I'm my cousin Emil, you know. So for me, it was when they would say I was different, I said, no, I'm not different, you know. I just made it. Not a lot of cities get called <clears throat> upon to reinvent themselves in a matter of years yeah. with the eyes of the world on mm -hmm. them and $71 billion, which is what's been spent so yes. far. If you'd had your way, what, what would this city be like now? What would have happened with that money? What, what, did you even think of it at the time? What a chance, what an opportunity That's a very good question. Uh, there are a couple of things I regret. I, I, I'm always amazed when people say they, uh, if they did it all over, they would do the same thing. That's bullshit. I can say bullshit twice. You just did. Yeah, that's twice. yeah, that's bullshit <laughs> uh, three times. Um, I would have changed my vote on public housing. Uh, we tore down some of the most reliable, uh, sturdiest, hurricane-proof buildings in, in America. We fell for uh, HUD and the federal government's lie about one-for-one -one replacement and about using the money to uplift uh, working class and poor people. That still hasn't happened ten years later. Uh, I, uh, I would, I would, I would also would have done with Dr. Kobayashi in, from Kobe University. When I traveled abroad and, and went to Japan, I met with a lot of UNDP, United Nations Disaster Prevention Bureau people, in Kobayashi, and they talked about how we should have established uh, our working class people first. You know, our mayor and too many of our business people wanted a market based recovery, and that's what we got. Uh, we should have fought for a, uh, a, a, a community-based recovery. We, we should have brought our working class people back, set up temporary housing, schools and medical for them, and then built from there. Uh, since we didn't do that, that's why we're struggling. That's why a 10-year recovery will probably wind up being a 20 for some if it ever happens. How's the New, new Orleans treating you? I survive, you know, uh, and that's another th thing where, you know, people are amazed at uh, how well I do after what I've go gone through in my life, you know, uh, hurricanes, going to prison, uh, and coming back and kind of reinventing myself. Uh, but I have relationships and I have education. So if, you know, if they build a wall too high, I'm going to find a way to go over it if I don't try to go through it. But for too many who don't have my relationships and my skills and my education, uh, that wall has been a permanent wall. So it's funny, uh, post uh, Katrina 10 years, $71 billion, the disparity gap in earnings between blacks and whites is 10% per worse. Uh, women, single women here, have some of the highest poverty statistics in the nation, uh, right here in New Orleans. The data center just released a report that said that child poverty and family poverty is the greatest obstacle to New Orleans sustainable success, not crime not education, but poverty. So it's a tale, the uh, great playwright August Wilson talks, when his, uh, his uh, play, Two Trains Running, talks about the dualities of life. New Orleans is two trains on two different tracks. There's one track headed for the cliff, and there's another track that's kind of uh, trapped in its own utopia until it gets to the same cliff. I want to come back to some mm -hmm. of the things you maybe thought you could do in government. Mm -hmm. Concrete things. Yeah. Uh, what kind of things could, could you have done? If you've become mayor, say, what kind of things could you have done? What tools are in the hands of local government to make uh, the kind of change you're talking about? Well, I actually uh, thought that we were supposed to focus on infrastructure first. 
uh, I started a, uh, a committee, uh, 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 a disaster and reconstruction council uh, recon uh, infrastructure committee that I think they kind of disbanded when I, when I, when I went on vacation. Uh, but I thought that's what we should have done. Uh, we, we had this philosophy like, well, we can't or we shouldn't develop here because nobody's there. Well, that was the wrong way to do it. You know, if, if we were going to start a new community somewhere, we would put in the infrastructure and we would make it appealing for people to come back. Had I stayed around, uh, had, I, had I been mayor, I had that kind of authority, I would have went all out on infrastructure. Make the Ninth Ward, make parts of Gentilly, make New Orleans East, make those areas where people uh, want to come back home. Make it inviting and appealing for, the, for them to come home. The next thing that I would have did was I would have incentivized retail and development in those areas. Nothing from nothing is nothing. Government has to stop getting its off the top. Government wants to get paid even when everybody else doesn't get paid. I thought that we had we incentivized growth, growth and development, especially when we, when we had the discussion around the New Orleans Hospital, right? New Orleans Hospital could have been done a long time ago. We could have made it a research and development hospital around chronic il illnesses uh, for women and African Americans. This is Cancer Alley. We have some of the highest chronic causes of chronic illness amongst people of color and women in the nation here. So why not incentivize uh, 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 growth around the hospital and give it away, tax incentives, 5, 10, 15 year period. We could have used New Orleans Hospital as a centerpiece and it could, could have gotten up a long time, uh, lo much longer before it done. If, as we have used it as a research vehicle around chronic illnesses, around uh, depression, around mental illnesses uh, after a major disaster, uh, incentivize uh, research, uh, you know, just like we did with the Bio Medical Center downtown. Why not do the same thing out in New Orleans East use it as, as, a, as a growth vehicle to bring that area back. Uh, you know, uh, local preferences for contractors, uh, women and, and minorities, the language should have been uh, shell, not may. You know, but it was a pyramid scheme. Well, that was my next question. What did you learn about how things actually work? It was a pyramid scheme. Uh, international and national developers who had connections uh, were uh, level one. Uh, they got 97 cents, uh, nine, not, uh, 80 or 90 cents on a the dollar. They came and they contracted out to their friends who maybe got another few pennies on a dollar. And then them to make it look good, they make it uh, farm out very little work, which was actually most of the heavy lifting to locals at three or four cents on a dollar. So it was, it was a $71 billion pyramid scheme. What did you learn about the role of money in politics in New Orleans? And has anything changed? Well, no, it hasn't changed around the world right now. Uh, I think uh, capitalism uh, reigns supreme. It's creeping into every native culture uh, and under every, every indigenous rock uh, in the world. And the 1 and 2 percent have escalated their effort. Uh, I don't think they, they know where we're headed, but I don't think they care. But your current mayor says the city is growing faster than ever. People are coming to the city more than ever. Um, some New Orleanians, born and bred, say the new Orleans, the new New Orleans is a better place. Yeah. Uh, um, hasn't money produced jobs and new houses and beautiful streets and so on? Fifty-two percent of African American men are unemployed in uh, a booming economy, in one of the most robust economies. Uh, Fourteen percent of the fifty-two percent. Uh, have college degrees and are certified in their in their field, uh, their discipline. They have transportation and they can pass drug tests. They're still unemployed. Uh, women uh, uh, lag behind for the same job. On average, make twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars less uh, here. We 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 still don't know uh, the disparity in terms of contracting. We're minority contractors. And, and, and women and local contractors are fighting every day uh, to stop these international and national on, on, uh, onslaughts uh, from these major corporations that are, that are cream skimming and, uh, and raiding all of the coffers, recovery coffers. So, uh, yeah, it, it is a tale of two cities. But one tail is wagging, the other tail is tucked under its legs. So what's your advice to young men of color in particular, maybe the, you know, young kids coming out of lower ninth as you once did. Educate yourself as best you can. Uh, create your own economy. Uh, discipline. Uh, 
yourself, get involved. We have to get back to, I, I think, where we were in the 60s and 70s in terms of the cause. Capitalism is so powerful that well-intended people, every now and then, wonder if the cause is worth it because they try to figure out, they're trying to survive. Uh, that's what uh, disaster capitalism has done to America and much of the world right now. So I would say discipline yourself. Find a cause or an effort. Uh, do not be strangled by capitalism, but find a cause that, that is so powerful that is part of who you are. Talk a little bit about gentrification in the city, what's going on and how to navigate that. Gentrification is creating so much angst and anger that someone needs to get ahead of it uh, real soon or there are going to be some major conflict and there are already conflicts around it. You know, we've had gangs of young African-American men who are assaulting people who all they wanted, to, all they did was take advantage of an opportunity. They're not even robbing them. They're assaulting them because they're in their community. And my mother had to move out. She can't afford to live anymore. Why are you walking here or riding your bike so happy-go-lucky when I can't stay? Uh, if we don't solve this question around gentrification, we're going to create pockets of super poverty that line the outskirts of the city. Uh, they're going to be extremely dangerous because they're going to make you uncomfortable when they raid the core. Uh, one of the last gangs that were caught were gangs of, uh, I think, four 13-year-olds and 14 and 15-year-olds. I mean, they were robbing people in the quarter in downtown and they were caught on the bus going back to New Orleans East, we're pushing people to the outskirts spirits of the city. We need to develop policies uh, that, that have rent control. Uh, we need to start having soft seconds in, in programs so that they can continue to own and improve those old properties. You know, uh, those things have to be intentional right now. Capitalism, uh, it, it's a beast that takes its own shape and initiates its own movements and its own cause. So, you, so you, if you are not as, del as deliberate on the other side as that beast is, it, w it, w it, will, it will consume everything that it touches. I think of your original story mm -hmm. and the kid who wouldn't move to rescue without his mother. Right. That spirit is still here. As, yeah. a, as a politician, how do you rekindle that, or do you see it anyway? Yeah, it is. It is. That, that's a wonderful question. Um, but you have to believe in that spirit, in those people that America says have, don't have value or have less value. They've been profiled. They're on Crime Stoppers billboards. When, when, when the police officer, Darren Wilson, said he saw uh, uh, this, this Mike Brown, when he saw a demon, he saw what America presented in terms of blackness and color and black men. So you have to believe in that spirit. And it should be easy to believe in that spirit because we're still here. You know, New Orleans is the greatest collection of survivors ever. Poverty, malaria, flood of 1927, Betsy, Camille, Katrina, more poverty, more neglect, more disparity, mass incarceration in Louisiana and New Orleans, the highest per capita. So we've survived anyway. does one begin to tell of the end when somewhere in the middle truth lies belly up in the gutter dingy and still stained with poverty the type no detergent can get out of nowhere she said water ran up the street asked if I had ever seen something you normally only hear about and now her house is home to nothing and no one except the memories she remembers as she stands atop broken bunk beds and shards the only picture she ever had of her mother and father together she remembers happy here before the rain came, before the flood of filth filled their eyes, circus-like, she said, they think we are fools when really they are the clowns. Step right up, hurry, hurry, for little or nothing you can see the best of the worst first come, first served. This is destruction at its finest. Death has never looked so sweet, and if you give them a treat, I guarantee they'll smile wide. Just hold on tight and watch your purse. We couldn't get rid of all the poor folks. I know, I know, we'll get over this hump. You'll see New Orleans will be a great theme park, even better than Vegas and certainly Disney. No worries, there's a bunch of developers to assist me. 
Meanwhile, privatization is taking over public housing, mixed income facility, kick them out by the thousands. Every place we've torn down can look like River Gardens. Wouldn't you prefer that over the old St. Thomas? We want to see our homes rebuilt. Be still, be patient. It takes time to build these neighborhood associations. Excuse me, healthy, vibrant, sustainable communities. But really, Mr. Developer, what does that mean? It sounds like gentrification shrouded in a pretty language with good intentions. Many say the road to hell is paved with the same. I wonder what kind of forklift is required to raise our souls from this muck and mire? Or what kind of fire must burn to purge our hearts of the heaviness that comes with holding a hope so heavy it hurts? That was Sonny Patterson, filmed as part of an interactive documentary called Land of Opportunity. You can see more from Sonny and a lot more on recovery from Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy at their website, landofopportunityinteractive.com. And you can see more from Oliver Thomas and our coverage of New Orleans at our website, grittv.org. It is New Orleans Remembrance Time, that time where for the last 10 years at the end of August, public attention returns for a bit to the city that abandoned its poorest to cling together on rooftops. Mostly black in a majority black city, democracy failed as spectacularly as the public safety system in New Orleans. Not only the levees, but also the social contract was breached. In the richest, most arrogant democracy on earth, it shocked the world and broke our hearts. Ten years on, the city is back. The levees are rebuilt, but the social contract's still in shreds. Let's remember, Hurricane Katrina didn't destroy New Orleans. The storm's eye passed to the east of the city. The levee breaks that followed wiped entire neighborhoods out. And public safety systems that had never served all residents well failed the most vulnerable again. A million were displaced, hundreds of thousands lost land and loved ones. Ten years on, the census reports that the region's regained almost 94% of its pre-storm population. New Orleans is almost 80% as big as it was before. Statistical successes are tallied up in graduation rates from new private schools, people housed in new private homes, and patients cured in private hospitals. A new sprawling university medical centers open soon. But instead of fixing its public accountability problems, the city's farmed those out to public contractors and the profit system. The poor black residents who were losing homes and loved ones 10 years ago are losing them still to gentrification. If you're rich and like your property prices to rise, it's good news to you that house prices are up 58% since 2000. An employer, wages are as low as they get, and worker bargaining power has sunk lower than that. A whiter, wealthier city? You've got it. Entire neighborhoods have flipped from black to white. But democracy? That principle that societies are held together by a diverse fabric and being a member of one requires looking after one another? While some communities are still clinging on to that idea, that principle's been left to drown on a rooftop and not just in the Big Easy. What's different is there's no shock in it. New Orleans' recovery numbers look a whole lot like the rest of the nation's. Recovery? Whose recovery? Who's clinging to your city's rooftops? To tell me what you think, write to me, laura at grittv.org, and thanks. <laughs>
our mayor and too many of our business people wanted a market-based recovery, and that's what we got. Uh, we should have fought for a, uh, a, a, a community-based recovery. They see the Mardi Gras, you know, they look at the French quarters, all these things are truly happening. It has come back, for, but for the local people, the local people are not bad. The local people are being pushed out of work, pushed out of housing, pushed into poverty. People, when they think of New Orleans, they would just think that like, like we are a beacon, like just everything is just great here. Um, but it's not. What we have to look at is the refusal to acknowledge race. 